um, was available on the Friday of this week last year to, um, to teach us some self-defense uh, for our Friday activity. And, um, and so to make that work, I moved chapter four up. So if you're thinking, why am I only suddenly doing chapter four and then going back, that's why. Um, thank you for so many of you did your participation on Friday. I really enjoyed watching your videos. I gave you all a, a little bit of feedback. Um, that was a lot of fun to, to get to see you being active and, and doing something towards your health. So thanks a lot for that. Um, good participation points earned there. Um, now, chapter four um, has some quite disturbing material in it, um, but I think it's really important to look at this chapter. Um, hopefully, you know, you've got Wednesday to read it thoroughly and answer the questions. Um, my goal today isn't to cover all the material in the chapter. I just want to highlight couple of items and also add some information in and maybe get some discussion um, going about a couple of things. Uh, remember that um, we're going to hold a safe space here for anyone to have their opinion as long as we're respectful about other people. Okay? Um, there's going likely to be quite a range of opinions on some of this material, okay? Um, and that's all right, okay? So no one's telling you what you have to think about this information. I'm hoping I can uh, expand your experience of this information um, so that, you know, maybe that will change some of your ideas, maybe it won't, right? It, your learning curve, okay? So, I'm going to embed the, oh my gosh, lovely, we've got loads of people. Super. Okay, I'm going to embed the PowerPoint. killed and um, you know 
doesn't seem fair that a little child gets shot in his house because someone was shooting outside in the street and a stray bullet entered the house and killed a little child, but that has happened recently as well. Okay, um, and I think um, the statistics in this chapter will shock you. So in 2015, so this data is a little bit old, um, that homicide was the third leading cause of death for American children aged one to four, and also 15 to 34, and the fourth leading cause of death for age five to 14, for all Americans. And if you look at the um, data on the black population, those numbers are even worse, okay? So just imagine the third leading cause of death for children one to four is being killed. Not disease, not an accident, right? Being killed. So I think that's something to really think about. What, what is going on in our communities that we're seeing this level of violence and abuse? Okay. Um, We'll come back to the idea of rape victims, but you know they may need immediate treatment um, if they're willing to come forward, right? Um, because you don't know if the person who raped you had any kind of sexually transmitted disease or HIV, if it's a female who's been raped by a male, then Maybe there's an unintended pregnancy and she may or may not want to go through with that, right? And also we've got to take into account not just the physical side of what's going on, but then the psychological, the mental health of people that have um, been abused or been the victims of violence, right? Often these people report developing anxiety and or depression. Um, those, those mental health problems can impact, impact their ability to do their job properly. It can impact their ability to interact with their friends and their family in appropriate ways. Um, it's often difficult to ask for help because you don't want to have to rehash what it was that happened to you that led to you feeling like this, right? So um, there's, there's some problems. And then a really big problem that we see is that when young children are growing up in a house where there is a lot of abuse and possibly violence, that those children tend to become violent Adults, or they feel like the way to resolve a conflict is with violence. And that can happen even with very young children. I mean, I, I worked with a little boy back when I was doing my PhD, and we would notice this odd behavior on the playground. Um, if he wanted a toy that someone else was playing with, he would walk up to that person and literally punch them in the face and just walk, take the toy and walk away. And he was two and a half, three when this behavior started. Um, and what we found out from the teachers was that one day his mum had come in to pick him up with a great big black eye. Right? So violence is a learned behavior. right? And if you think that that's the way to achieve what you want, because that's what you've been watching happen, then that's how you behave, right? So this intergenerational transmission is a, is a problem for these young children. You know, they grow up to be people that can't manage their anger very well, quite often, 
right? Not always, not always, it's not 100%, right? But a lot of people that grow up in that kind of environment become people who struggle with their anger. So one of the things I wanted to point out to you, the, the book, the chapter talks about the fact that um, being a victim of violence or being a victim of ongoing abuse um, can affect your immune system, but I wanted to give you a little more um, information about that idea. So when we look at the effects of stress on the immune system, um, they're wide ranging depending upon the level of stress and the occurrence of stress. Now, um, if you stay in the program and you take more classes with me, then we'll talk a lot more about the fact that you know, what are stress sores in our life. Exercise is physiologically stressful. Okay? But on the whole, we consider exercise to be a positive stress on the body up to a point. Okay? So we can have positive stress and negative stress. All right? The level of overall stress is quite important to look at sometimes. Negative stresses can be a really um, toxic work environment. Right? So you dread going to work every day because no one gets on, there are loads of arguments, or you've got a boss who's particularly unpleasant and um, you know, doesn't support his workers. Um, or maybe you have a, uh, a work colleague who sneaks watching child porn on their computer. Right? And you have to manage that. It's not something you want to be looking at. Or you have a um, you have a colleague who makes low-key sexual harassment comments. Right? So they can be very subtle, but they they build up into this environment that you just you like you wake up in the morning you're like I just don't. Want Right? Or the stress could be at home. You could be going through a divorce. Or you could be pregnant. Right? Pregnant's another instance of a positive stress. But it's a stress. Okay? So what happens in the body when we get stressed? The short-term response to stress that is um, not completely off the chart is that it upregulates your immune system. That means it facilitates your immune system to work better. Okay? However, if we look at chronic, ongoing, everyday kind of stress, particularly if it's overwhelming and it's beginning to get you down, then what we see is that that stress, the effects of that stress on your body down-regulates your immune system. So what happens when you get stressed, you release all kinds of different um, hormones and um, you know, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, um, you release adrenaline, you release cortisol, and all of these things are quite good in the short term. But over time, if your heart rate is always raised and your blood pressure is always raised and you keep releasing cortisol into the system, then that can downregulate, impact how well your immune system can work. Right? So in this diagram, what we see is this is the intensity of the stress on the x-axis and the risk of infection, so how well my immune system is working, on the y-axis. 
So what we see is, for example, we're looking at exercise as the stressor, right? If I'm a sedentary person, then my risk of infection is relatively high, right? If I'm moderately active, then my risk of infection becomes much lower because that moderate activity, that moderate exercise like your walk on Friday, benefits your immune system and makes you better able to fight off infection. Right? If, however, the intensity of your exercise is very high, so you either work out really, really hard every single day without a rest, or you do hours and hours and hours of exercise, right? Then what we see is a much higher risk of infection. This really depresses, that level of exercise really depresses your immune system. Okay? Which is why we quite often see athletes who've been training hard and getting in shape for a game or for a particular competition get sick, right? Either right before or right after the competition. Okay? They'll catch a cold or they'll get a chest infection or they'll get a stomach, stomach burn because their immune system has been squashed a little bit with all that training. So again, right now, given what's going on in our world, um, what on earth would cause someone to be that violent to another person? You know, um, I don't know a lot about guns, but I'm thinking that policeman that shot the young man in his back could have shot him in the back of his knee instead of in his back, and then he wouldn't be paralyzed. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but the causes of violence are hugely complex when you look across a population. There's not really a single cause of violent behavior. Usually it's an amalgamation of different factors that all come together and cause this person to blow up, right? Um, so that could be frustration at work or frustration because the guy you like clearly doesn't like you. Or it could be substance abuse, right? It could be um, drinking too much alcohol. Or you could be taking meth or something else, right? It could be psychological problems. So when we're talking about trying to keep ourselves healthy and well in a holistic idea, my mental health is really important to how I deal with other factors that might make me lose my temper. Right? As I said earlier, violence is a learned behavior. All right? We have lots of research that supports that idea. And so, Things that children are seeing at home or in the media or experiencing, right? Um, you know, I just can't get over. I'm, I'm sorry if I go on about this today, but I just cannot get over that that policeman shot that guy in the back in front of three young children. <laughs> that it, it's just shocking to me that his training let him down at that point in time because I don't believe that all the training that these people who are brave enough to be police officers and, and other forms of, of protection are told that that's the behavior they should do. I just, I can't believe that. So, you know, somewhere there was a disconnect, somewhere that all that training broke down in that moment. Right? So these children had to witness that, 
children are living in houses that are um, where they're being abused, so they could be actually physically being abused, or they could be at least observing abuse. One of the big problems with closing the schools down because of coronavirus is that the school is often the only place that a child who's being abused has to go where the abuser isn't, right? And it's often teachers or um, medical staff at schools that, that can identify that a particular child is being abused and report that problem, right? So closing down the schools meant that for many children, teenagers, parents, that that meant they were shut in a house 24 hours a day with the person who's abusing them, right? So one of the reasons there's such a big push to try to get at least the K through high school back into school, even though we know it's dangerous to have groups of people, is to try to get these individuals out of these horrible negative situations. So it's, it's a very difficult um, balancing act there. Right? If I bring everybody back, everyone could get sick, some of them could die. <laughs> right? But if I don't bring them back, some of them might die anyway. Right? So it's, I'm really glad I don't have to make the decision. That's, I can say that for now. I would not want to be the person responsible for making the decision about whether public aid open back up in a state, right? It's very, very difficult. Um, I've got a link there, I'll just show you. Um, let me show you. This link will take you to a... So that link will take you to this page. Can you see this? Oh, yes, we can. Yeah? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so this is just some of the research um, that is arguing that certain media games maybe should not be available to certain populations of children. Um, it's quite an interesting take on um, anesthetizing children's um, response to seeing something that's violent. I think that's what I'm trying to say. That, the, that what the research is supporting, and again, you know, you don't, I'm sure if you went out there, I mean, I looked specifically for this because I work with children, and in my opinion, I have seen this, um, but I suspect you could go out and find research that says, playing violent video games makes no difference to this kid's approach. I'm sure you could, right? So. I, I hold my hand up that this is a little bit biased, okay? Um, but that what, ha what, they, what they are trying to say on this side of the argument is that the more they play these violent games, the less they understand what violence really means, right? Because it becomes unreal, okay? Um, so anyway, it's there if you want to look at it. I wanted to um, show you that. Let's go back to stop showing that one and go back to here. Okay, 
Um, so the chapter looks at some different categories of violence and abuse. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about sexual violence and abuse, partly because um, hopefully you guys will be coming back to campus soon. And um, I don't know the data for our campus, I have to say, but um, a lot of sexual abuse occurs on campuses, right? So I wanted to kind of give you uh, a little window on some of this information so that maybe um, that will keep you interested to read that info. If you look at page 103, they have a managing your health item. Really make sure to read that carefully. They're looking at um, bystander intervention. So for example, if you guys were at a party or you're walking across campus, right, and you saw something that didn't quite add up, right, what would you do? Okay. What would be your response? I'd like to think that I would have the courage or that I would respond before I thought about it enough to get scared of doing it, to go over and try to intervene, right? To either, the, and they give you some strategies for that, you know, you can pretend you know this person that you think might be in trouble and you can just walk over and go, oh hi, I haven't seen you for so long. Give them a big hug and go, come on, let's go grab a coffee, right? And get them out of that. Would I actually do that? I'd like to think I would. Although, I have to say, if I'm totally honest, I think I would be more likely to do that back in England than here. Because here, you know, back in England, the chance that that person, they may have a knife, of course, but the chance of that person having a gun is much, 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 much lower <laughs> than it is here. So, you know, do you call 911? Okay, well, that's good, but by the time the police get there, it might be too late, right? I don't know. I don't know. So think about that. As I said, I'm not telling you what to think um, or how to feel. I'm just trying to encourage you to think about it. What do you feel? Right? We spend a lot of time, as I said at the beginning, shoving these thoughts that things that aren't comfortable to think about, we tend to ignore. Right? But I'm not sure that now, at this point in history, is the time to be ignoring these ideas. Right? I need to think about, sit with it for a little while, be uncomfortable, that's okay. Anybody got any comments? No one? They're, they're, you're all sitting there going, oh my god, doctor, shut up, this is... <laughs>
but they still go up to the bar to order another drink. What would you do? Stop them. Stop them? Okay, how would you approach that, do you think? Right? Are you, are you going to literally just like grab them and pull them away from the bar? That might not be very effective. What do, you, what do you think you would actually, how would you approach stopping them? I think stopping them is a great idea, right? How would you approach that? Because ultimately they're an adult, otherwise they wouldn't be in the bar. So you, you might not be able to stop them, right? So how would you approach trying? Maybe take them from the most probably to dance or to eat anything away from them. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely take their car keys away, right? And tell them you're going to drive them home or you're going to call them a cab. Right? One of the activities, if you were here in class, that I would make you do. And I would do it now at home anyway, because you're going to be back on campus at some point, is go to the ENMU website and find the phone number for the safe ride and put it in your phone on speed dial. Right? Because you can use safe ride for any reason. You can use it because you realize you've had too much to drink and you shouldn't be driving home. You could use it because you went to a party with some friends and they've disappeared and now you don't have a way of getting home. You can use it because you're walking home from working a late shift and you don't feel comfortable because there's someone walking down the road behind you and it feels a bit kind of creepy. You can call safe right? So, I really would strongly ask you <laughs> to find the safe ride number and put it on speed dial in your phone. Okay. All right, so let's have a look at some of the terminology here. So, sexual violence is force, threat of force, or coercion. Rape is specifically connected with intercourse by force or, and here's the interesting bit, with a person incapable of legal consent. Okay. So, this person may want to have sex with you. But if they're incapable of giving legal consent in a court of law, that would still be considered rape. Even though, was it rape? Right? Is there an acceptable difference? Do we, do we, I mean, we, we know that people under the legal age have sex. Right? We know because there's these young kids walking around Walmart with babies. So it didn't fall out of the sky. Right? So we know they're having sex before the age of legal consent. So if I have two individuals who are accused of rape and one of them raped someone while they were drunk or they gave them drugs and then raped them and the other is having sex with their girlfriend, boyfriend. Is that the same situation? Ethically, do I feel, I don't know, right? Legally, it's the same situation. So there's some fuzzy stuff in here. Right? 
If we look at the data in the states, one in five women, one in 71 men, have been the victims of an attempted or completed rape. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. And interestingly, when it's reported, and this is, this is data that's reported, right? This doesn't take into account the number of people that have been raped who shut down and won't ever tell anybody about it, right? So of the reported rapes, what the data indicates is that most females are raped by someone they know. So it's a family member or a friend, or at least someone who's in class with you, right? So you know them across the room. Okay. When you look at the data on men, then male victims are more often raped by a stranger and a really kind of low-key acquaintance. So let's go back to this idea of legal consent. Who knows what the age of legal consent is in the state they grew up in? In Texas, it's 17, I believe. Okay. Anyone from anywhere different? To me, coming from England, which, you know, remember England's tiny, fits into Alabama, so it's a whole different ballpark, right? We, there's a legal age of consent, 16, right? But over here, depends where you live. So, does that cause problems, right? So let me show you. An, an interesting map. So this is fascinating to me because you've got three different layers of consent. So, the, the easy statement is anybody 15 and under cannot legally consent to sex, right? So, what if you live up here in the Four Corners, right? <laughs> and you're dating someone who lives in the town next to you, but that town happens to go across the state line. So here I've got 18, 16, and 17, all within, what, 20 miles of each other in the four corners, right? And that situation occurs in quite a lot of places around the states. So what if I'm 17 and I'm dating someone who's 16 and she's from a state where the legal age is 18 but I'm from a state where the legal age is 17, it's kind of messy. I could get very complicated, I think. Um, you know, if I'm the parent of this, or one of the parents of one of this partnership, how do I feel about that? 
Is that right? Do I report that to the police? If I know it's happening, which I might not, right? Sort of tricky, I think. Right? It's not cut and dry. That's all I'm trying to point out to you, really. As I said, again, I'm not trying to tell you how to think. I'm just trying to point out to you that sometimes we make very black and white decisions about something that is a little bit messy. It's not black and white. Okay? It's, it's, there's fuzz in there. Okay? Comments, questions, experiences. As I said, they look at several different um, groupings of violence and abuse. So um, they also look at some ideas around family violence, which can include spousal or child or elder abuse. Um, usually, um, Family violence exhibits a pattern of behavior that includes physical assaults, um, that could be sexual assault, or it could be emotional assault, right? Just because someone doesn't hit you doesn't mean they're not assaulting you, okay? And that's an important point to make, I think. Um, it could be you know, spousal or couples. Um, it could be unrelated individuals who are living in a, a house or a flat together. Um, one of the things, again, I, I encourage you to read this chapter very thoroughly on Wednesday. But in particular, make sure that you have a look at table 4.1. Um, because that table highlights characteristics and behaviors that are often red flags for intimate partner or spousal violence. And so I think it's, whilst we might not want to admit that we need to know that, I think that those are important flags to recognize so that if we need to, maybe we can get out before we get right um, sexual harassment and they give you some examples of sexual harassment all right so that can be quite an interesting one particularly when you're looking at the workplace because it counts you know if you have like so if you're a young not me if you're a young attractive female and you like to dress attractively and you go to work every day and, so, and this, the same guy wolf whistles you or comes over and pats your bum or, right? That's sexual harassment. It is, okay? So it's, I think, again, and it doesn't just happen male on female, right? There are plenty of cases where a female boss has used that power to sexually harass a male colleague who works for her, right? 
So, um, you know, however, I think it is interesting when you look at um, a woman's situation. Um, so it wasn't until 1978 that a woman was that a woman's job was protected if she got pregnant. Right. So before 1978 in the states, if she got pregnant, her boss could sack her because she wasn't going to be able to do her job properly. Right? Sexual harassment in the workplace. It wasn't until 1977 that a woman could, could go and um, complain of sexual harassment. Right? Now, actually, that sexual harassment 1977 Act also applied to men. But back in 1977, there weren't a lot of men complaining about being sexually harassed. And that's for, for a guy to admit that, that's taken a lot more development of the male psyche. It's a much more recent event that a, that a guy feels comfortable with himself enough that he could say that. Sorry if I'm being. I'm trying to say this in a way that is not offensive, so I really hope I'm not offending anybody um, the way I'm putting this. Um, they also talk about stalking, community violence, institutional violence, so mostly in schools, um, workplace violence, and then they talk a little bit about terrorism which is um, a relatively unknown in this country, uh, totally unknown until 9-11, of course. But even since 9-11, terrorism isn't, uh, isn't I think, uh, an act of violence that most Americans think about. Um, whereas if you're over in Europe or in the Middle East, that's something that's much more, um, that occurrence is, is much more part of everyday life. I grew up when the IRA um, were at their height in the UK, and um, I'm not saying that the IRA didn't have an argument to make, I think the way the British, pub, the, the English, UK, British Parliament treated the Irish was abominable. But I grew up knowing that if I went shopping up in London, I could be involved in a bomb attack. Right? It's, it's, it's you know, and then you have to make that decision. Like, am I going to go? Because I'm not going to be scared by them. Or am I going to stay home? <laughs> right? um, but terrorism, I think, for Americans is, is a, different, a, a different problem to tackle how, how you feel about that, because it just doesn't occur very often here. Um, so those were my ideas that I wanted to kind of give you. And again, I've left this, I nearly took this slide out yesterday because I know, uh, or I've heard, I don't know because I haven't done enough research into it yet, um, but I know that there has been some issues in England around Winston Churchill um, being a racist and maybe uh, anti-female, not sure. As I said, I haven't done enough reading about it yet. But I really like this quote. I, I just like this quote. That if we know the right people and we spend time with the right people, that that can impact our health and our sense of peace within ourselves. 
stuff. Good, bad questions, ideas that this is bringing up for you. Time to go. So if you have anything that you want to share or talk about, right, we could create a little discussion board item. I mean, we could get a little chat going, do I agree, do I not agree, if you want to. Right? I, I would like to see that, but I'm not going to say you have to do that. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop recording. I will. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll be in the classroom on Wednesday. Remember, you don't have to dial in, but if you want to dial in and do your reading and do your questions so that you're held accountable for getting that work done, by all means join me. Or if you have questions. Get going on that. Yeah, it's all the 